Hey everyone, I just want to start this video by reaching out and saying a huge thank you to everyone who kind of got involved in the conversation on my last atheism video. It was really, really amazing to see so many different points of view. There was one guy who got a little bit kind of crazy about things, but let's not talk about him. And the rest of you were really amazing, even the people who didn't agree with me. Um, kind of opened me up to some new ideas. There was a really interesting kind of discussion going on about whether we choose our own beliefs or whether, like, you know, how much control we have over them, that kind of thing, which kind of gave me a lot of stuff to think about and I'm thinking about making a video on kind of that whole topic in the future. But today I'm going to be talking about this little article I found this morning um, titled Atheists Are Wrong! Five Reasons Why God Exists. So as you may know, I kind of like to think quite rationally about things, I'm quite sceptical and I don't really believe anything without any proof, which is why I don't really think that the idea of a god makes sense. I can understand why some people might want to believe in one, but I don't logically see how the idea of a god lines up with reality, fact, science, you know. But I thought I'd give this article a little read and I thought we could read it together and kind of see what we all think and maybe like have another little discussion because it was really great last time. So what I found really interesting about this article is how it starts out with this big statement saying most atheists in my experience have no good reason for their disbelief rather they learn to simply repeat the slogan there's no good evidence for God's existence. And I found this really interesting because a lot of the time this is the exact argument that atheists make about religious people and we say, well they don't really have a good reason for believing in X religion, it's just the religion they were brought up with. In my experience, a lot of the time, atheists have more of a reason for being atheists than religious people have for being religious. Um, but that's just my experience, so this is quite interesting that this guy has literally experienced the exact opposite and I think it's a really kind of interesting statement about how um, kind of our, our experiences with the people who are around us really shape things and we all kind of see the world in a very different way from each other. Anyway, the article goes on. Um, the atheist who merely repeats the slogan after having been presented with the arguments for God's existence makes an empty assertion. So what reasons might be given in defence of Christian theism? So this article centres around these kind of five ideas that this guy puts forward for why he believes God exists, or rather why he thinks there is proof that God exists. We're talking about like actual evidence here. So evidence is of course something that we can all see. Evidence is usually, well, evidence is objective. Evidence is fact. Um, and these are kind of like five bits of kind of evidence or proof that this guy puts forward that God exists. Um, it's quite quite interesting because to be honest his kind of evidence or reasons aren't so much objective or rather his reasons aren't backed up with evidence. You'll see what I mean when I get there but we'll start off with the first one which is God provides the best explanation for the origin of the universe. Given the scientific evidence we have about our universe and its origins um, blah, blah, blah. it's highly probable that the universe had an absolute beginning which I guess scientists think of as the Big Bang. Since the universe like everything else could not merely have popped into being without a cause, there must exist a transcendent reality beyond time and space that brought the universe into existence. This entity must therefore be enormously powerful. Only a transcendent unembodied mind suitably fits that description. By which I think he's referring to a god. So this, this is quite interesting. So the idea that something can't merely have popped into being without a cause is quite an interesting point. I agree with that, I agree that there had to be a cause or a spark but I don't agree that this had to be a, like a being or a spirit like God because I don't believe that this cause had to be kind of like predetermined or planned or um, I don't believe this had to be, I, I, I think it could just have been completely coincidental um, a matter of atoms clashing, a ma just, I don't know, something happening. I'll be honest, I'm not a physicist. I don't have enough of a detailed knowledge of physics to say this is how the Big Bang happened and this is what I think caused the universe to, like, be created. I have a solid understanding of what physicists think the Big Bang was and I have a solid enough understanding to say yes, I agree, that's how I think the universe came into existence. But I don't have enough to say this is what caused the Big Bang. Because there's still a lot of debate around it and a lot of people saying different things. Um, a lot of people say that 
like the kind of basic laws of physics don't support the idea that the Big Bang could have happened because of the one saying that you know energy can't be created or destroyed but then there's other evidence um, of these like kind of virtual particles which do kind of come into existence but they only have like a, sh a small amount of energy for a short amount of time and it's, it's all very complicated and my knowledge isn't quite at the level to explain it well enough so for this point I will leave a few links in the description below talking about possible explanations for the origin of the Big Bang and the origin of the universe because they explain it far better than I ever could. The second point goes on to say God provides the best explanation for the fine tuning of the universe. So this is the idea of a kind of like intelligent designer, intelligent creator, that sort of thing. Um, contemporary physics has established the, that the universe is fine tuned for the existence of intelligent interactive life. That is to say, in order for intelligent interactive life to exist, the fundamental constants and quantities of nature must fall into an incomprehensibly narrow life-permitting range. So yes, the fact that we are here, the fact that we have evolved the way we have, is incredible. It's so lucky that all these circumstances lined up, like one after the other. But when you think about how long the universe has been around, it's also kind of likely that something like this would have happened along the way. It just so happens that it happened when it did. Nature, evolution, all this stuff is all about kind of chance. Even one baby being made is all about chance. It's all about that one cell meeting another cell at the exact right moment. It's all about how that DNA combines in a certain specific way and how all of this is just luck and chance and somehow we end up with a little person coming out of it. I think that's pretty incredible. And that's exactly how the universe was created. It just happened over billions of years on a really huge scale and I think that's something amazing. I think that's even more impressive than the idea that there was a person out there designing and creating it all. But here's the thing, humans aren't perfect. Nature isn't perfect. The universe isn't perfect. And I think that is the kind of key bit of evidence against an intelligent designer. If we'd had an intelligent designer, humans would have been perfect from the beginning. We wouldn't get genetic mutations. We wouldn't have um, kind of, you know, problems with the human body. We wouldn't have the blind spot in the eye. We wouldn't have the appendix. I actually got a list up of some really interesting points of kind of fatal flaws in humans. Um, there's the idea of like ectopic pregnancies. Um, <laughs> how childbirth used to be one of the biggest sort of killers of adult women. It's these things that are like these crazy flaws within human beings and this isn't even like touching on all the flaws within all the different animals, insects, plants, everything else out there. There are a hell of a lot of problems with the earth, with its inhabitants, with the universe as a whole, a lot of problems. And if we were intelligently designed, they wouldn't be there. The next point is that God provides the best explanation of objective moral values and duties. I think I touched on this in my last atheism video, but I don't believe that morality is objective. I believe it is a social construct. And all you have to do is look back 100, 200 years and see that. One of the big points that was brought up in the comments of my last video was that kind of, you know, the Bible gives this objective morality and that like once we start changing it, where does it end? And this kind of thing. And someone kind of was disgusting and vile and called me a paedophile supporter because I said I wasn't against homosexuality. Because they were like, oh well, and, and I, I obviously use the argument, you know, what's wrong with two consenting adults choosing to be in a loving relationship? Like, you can't compare that to the physical and psychological abuse of an underdeveloped, unconsenting child. Like, they are completely different. This person argued that, oh no, the Bible condemns them both, so they're the same. That's just not true at all. But even if we take that kind of example of talking about society's um, view of children and way of treating children and this sort of thing, you can see that it has changed even over the last 100, 200 years. So therefore morality is an objective. Years ago it was okay to marry off a child at 12. It was acceptable for children as young as 7, 8 to go work in factories. Because this idea of childhood is a social construct. 
And if the Bible or religion in general was this source of objective morality, then that never would have happened. But the fact is that morality is socially constructed, and so the idea of how we treat other people does change, and it has changed over the years, like, dramatically. This article argues that God defines what is good and he dictates our morals and things, but to me that's not where we get our morality from. As human beings, and I, I spoke about this in my last video as well, we do have this kind of higher level of decision making that a lot of animals don't have, and because of that we are able to take into account empathy for others into our decision making process. And it's from experiencing this empathy that we can start to judge what is right and wrong. And that's where we get our morals from. And that's why our morality is subjective. Our uh, fourth point is that God provides the best explanation of the historical facts concerning Jesus' life, death and resurrection. So basically what you're trying to say is historians have proof that someone called Jesus existed, someone called Jesus thought he was the son of God, Someone called Jesus went round telling people that, and most historians agree that Jesus' tomb was empty after his crucifixion. That doesn't mean he was actually resurrected. I'm struggling to see how this proves there's a god. There's no, like, physical or objective evidence to say that he was a son of god. And, and this bit of the article here that says, I can think of no better explanation of these facts than the one of the original disciples gave. God raised Jesus from the dead. This is just like, um, is it Occam's razor that's something like, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one, right? So, a man called Jesus existed. That, that's fine. I have no problem with that, but that doesn't mean that he was God's son. It just means that a man called Jesus existed. A man called Jesus claimed he was the son of God is either because A, he was kind of indoctrinated into believing that when he was a kid to cover up the fact that his mum had sex outside marriage, or B, he wanted to go around saying that so he could feel important and get people to listen to him. The next point, that he went around carrying out um, that he went around performing miracles and things like that. There's no actual proof that he performed any of these miracles. Is there any actual proof of him turning water into wine? Is there any proof of him actually feeding 5,000 people with like a few fish and some bread? No. There's no evidence that those things actually happened. And if there was, there's no evidence that they weren't just some impressive party trick. And then coming back to the idea that um, his body was missing from the tomb after his crucifixion. Again, this doesn't mean he was resurrected by God. This simply means either someone moved his body, or someone was telling stories, or anything like that. There are a lot simpler explanations to this than God resurrected him. The last point on this is that God can be personally known and experienced. The proof of the pudding is in tasting. Down through history, Christians have found through Jesus a personal acquaintance with God that has tr transformed their lives. Again, I don't agree with this one because there's never been any objective evidence or proof that a God exists. People may say that they feel like, yeah, I feel comfortable and happy now I'm a Christian, I feel reassured now I'm a Christian, but that's not objective proof that a god exists. Anyway, that is pretty much me done. This could be a long video again and if it is, I'm sorry. But let's start a conversation in the comments again and let me know what you think. What do you think about these five reasons why god exists? Um, do you agree with them or disagree with them? Do you agree or disagree with me? Let me know down in the comments because I love to hear from you. But for now, thank you so so much for watching. I really appreciate it and I'll see you again soon.